first speaker is Les Vasily Lakoba. He was born in Russia, like the name sounds. And his family came to the U.S. and he did his undergraduate at Syracuse. And then he did a master's at Penn State. And then he's moving on south and he's working on a Ph.D. in the Barn Lab. So, Silly, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Should we have the lights on? What's that? Should we have the lights on? Yeah, um, I forgot to tell you. you turn the lights off. All right, everyone, thank you for uh, attending. I'm going to be talking to you about ecotypic variation in Johnson grass and its invaded U.S. range. So as we start, it's important to begin with a definition of terms. So uh, at a very basic level, biological invasion, uh, among other definitions, consists of a species acquiring a competitive advantage following the disappearance of natural obstacles to its proliferation, which allows it to spread rapidly and to conquer novel areas within recipient ecosystems in which it becomes a dominant population. And the, the bold section of that quote really is the bare bones definition, uh, which we'll do perhaps in defining invasion. So where does invasion matter? Where do we care about invasion? And that's across a broad spectrum of concerns. So one would be extractive land use. Uh, represented there, we got a picture of a weed in a wheat field. Uh, also matters in biological uh, conservation. It's a native cedar waxwing eating exotic uh, invasive honeysuckle fruit. It uh, matters in the formation of relevant policy. That's a boat checking station uh, trying to uh, control the spread of zebra mussel uh, in the Great Lakes region. And also matters in basic science, answering questions both specific to invasion and also just uh, basic ecological questions as well. And uh, given that the study of invasions usually takes into account four uh, basic stages. So there's transport, when the invader first arrives, colonization, where it gets a foothold, establishment, it starts to reproduce and, and produce more and more, and then landscape spread is where it really takes over and there's a moving invasion front. These four stages, uh, a lot of things change during them. Um, among them would be the abundance of the invader, of course, and also uh, in our hypothetical reaction to the invasion, the control costs. So you can see there's an S-shaped curve where there's a very rapid rise, and what's happening on the uh, left side in the beginning uh, in terms of abundance and control cost and what's happening on the right side is very very different and that change can be rapid so it's important to really understand when these four stages are happening and what we're dealing with uh, invasions uh, at the time uh, but then there's a question so what happens next because there's landscape spread you know eventually the the spread slows there's a almost an equilibrium reached in terms of range but uh, things don't stop changing, and we care about what happens uh, after landscape spread. So there's a number of things that can occur. Uh, the invader biology uh, oftentimes changes, uh, so things, things happen to it uh, uh, genetically, um, other, other adaptations. Uh, invader ecology changes, uh, so its role in the systems that uh, it's received by changes, or maybe its impact changes in those systems. But oftentimes, of course, both those, both those things change uh, in tandem, and evolutionary change and sometimes in invaders it's really interesting to look at because it happens sometimes very rapidly compared to other systems and this can be a good reason to study invasions as well as understanding what what happens at each stage so the reason we care for all those concerns is because what's going on here at the beginning versus here versus here and then onto this question mark zone uh, is gonna definitely shape our understanding of invasions to really try to uh, piece together what's happening and therefore our response. And it would be inappropriate to see invasion as just a single phenomenon, but really it's a string of uh, different occurrences over time and it's constantly changing. So that's what the role of basic science will be here. So if we're starting to look for evolutionary change post-invasion, where's a good place to start looking? So first of all, it would help if the invader has had a long presence in the invaded range it would also help if the invader has high genetic diversity between populations, and then it would also uh, be useful for us if that invader occupies a diverse variety of habitat, because of course diverse habitats have diverse selection pressures. And we're going to do that using uh, Johnson grass. So Johnson grass satisfies those <coughs> criteria. Johnson grass is a uh, perennial herb that's invasive in North America. Um, it is interesting for, for a number of reasons. One of those being is it reproduces vigorously through seed, uh, through the seed heads, and 
then also through a modified underground stem called a rhizome. Uh, so a seed head, a panicle in this case, can produce one to 400 seeds. Uh, and on a single plant, you can sometimes have upwards of 100 of those. And underground, uh, the vegetative reproduction sometimes uh, has been noted upwards of 100 feet of rhizome can be produced in a growing season. So quite a lot of both vegetative and sexual reproduction. Johnson grass uh, came over uh, in the 1820s, almost 200 years ago, uh, from its home range in the Middle East, uh, namely in this case from Turkey <coughs> to South Carolina as a forage crop, so nearly 200 years of invasion that satisfies one of our criteria. Uh, it has a broad range in uh, North America, here it's in the United States, a county-based um, map. Uh, generally you can see the trend of, you know, it's mostly in the southern half of the country, uh, although there's more nuance to that as we'll see later. Uh, and then about variation between populations, so in the uh, early stages of invasion, it was dominated, you can see the uh, agricultural uh, populations were dominant versus the non-agricultural habitats where it occurred. And then, uh, whereas coming to modern day, it's predominantly non-agricultural uh, in terms of the habitats that it takes over. So there's been that, that switch and there's been a lot of variation. So Johnson Guys really satisfies all those conditions we need to study. Uh, that type of change. And so on the previous slide, there, we were starting already to use the word ecotype, and I just wanted to define it. So an ecotype is a population, subspecies, or race that is adapted to local environmental conditions, which of course, on one hand, sounds like every species ever, but here the specific part is that it's adapted to an ecosystem, which uh, might mean a certain type of um, uh, management regime or just uh, community composition, so anything. So what are some of those questions that we can start to answer about these emergent ecotypes in Johnson grass? Uh, and we're going to take these apart, obviously, one by one later. So do agricultural and non-agricultural Johnson grass populations respond differently to drought and fertilization? So there have been some studies already starting to show that they respond differently to uh, competition uh, types and um, climate variables. Uh, but that's been done on a small scale, so we want to look into that a little bit more. Uh, we also want to answer a question or start to address the question of do ecotypes have different climate envelopes over time? And a third question would be do climatic limitations of rhizome and seed survival differ based on ecotype and origin? And that has to do with the two methods of reproduction and we're going to address that on its own too. So starting with that first question, do agricultural and non-agricultural uh, populations respond differently to drought and fertilization? This is going to be an experimental uh, design and it's important to select our populations that we work on carefully. Uh, so here on a map, uh, these are populations that are take, that we have uh, seed material from from the same uh, increase garden uh, here in Blacksburg, uh, but their sources are from all these points across the United States. And of those, we want to make sure we're selecting the right ones for the experiment. So we want to sure we want to be, be sure obviously we select ag and non-ag because that's one of our chief questions. So the little uh, corn plant here symbolizes ag, the railroad symbolizes not ag, and you'll see those symbols come up later. And then the colors of the dots, you'll see now they're separated. Uh, so on each map, um, the closer you are to the deep red, the drier, uh, basically lower, uh, lower precip levels of the home habitat, and the closer it is to a deep blue, the more moisture is available in that home habitat. And so of course we want to get that precip gradient across both the ag and the non ag. Uh, and that's how we select our populations. So we get 10 populations, 5 ag, from, 5 non ag from across the precip gradient. Uh, we subject them to treatments of uh, drought, no drought, fertilization, no fertilization. Um, we apply that in a way that roughly tries to simulate uh, field conditions. Uh, here they are set up in a greenhouse. We're focusing here on early uh, establishment life stage because it's a very sensitive uh, time period during the plant's life. Um, so we're not focusing on later life stages, um, uh, like flowering and seeding like that. So there's little plants there, they're in the racks and the pods, and you can see the irrigation uh, tubes. Some of them get irrigated, some of them do not, et cetera, et cetera. So about a month passes, they grow up, uh, and then we start to look at differences. So of course there's going to be treatment differences, first of all, um, more in the realm of the obvious uh, in terms of you know drought versus no drought. Of course water helps top row looks better, and then within the top row, when you even add fertilizer to the uh, water, works even better. So that's that's expected, but what we really care about is um, 
are there differences between populations, and do those differences tell us anything about um, cumulative differences about ag versus non-ag or some other kind of change? And so these data are just recently came in, and we're just starting to analyze them. Um, but there are some, uh, maybe if not trends necessarily, but certainly differences. <coughs> so this is, again, you can see um, ag and non-ag. That's how these uh, bars are labeled. And then across the bottom is the different precip gradients, which are also corroborated by the colors, right? So you remember the red is more the driest, the um, blue is the wettest. And so there's, there's certainly some interesting differences within precip gradients between ag and non-ag, and also as a trend across the, um, across the spectrum. But this is ongoing, and so there will be more analysis on this at a later date. Moving on to the next question, do ecotypes have different climate envelopes over time? So we need to define, define what a climate envelope is and how we're going to approach that. So this is a, a modeling project. Uh, climate envelope describes the composite of climatic ranges within which a species is observed to exist. Uh, and it's descriptive rather than explanatory, so it's not uh, mechanistically saying where the species can, can be just based on observation. Uh, and at a very simple level, I'll, I'll try to explain how, how that is done. Uh, so here are our points. We remember the county level map, and this is actually a point map. So these are all those individual uh, points that show where uh, confirmed records of Johnson grass have been made in the U.S. Uh, and you can see there's uh, greater densities in some areas, fewer dense lessons in other areas. Sometimes there's, there's no density at all. Um, now those points, they all fall somewhere, and we know a certain amount of things about those points, in particular certain climate norms and variables. Uh, this, I think, was a, a temperature map, a uh, mean annual temp. So we take those data for different climate variables, let's pretend for moisture and temperature. We extract them, and then we get a projection in climate space. So climate space, uh, again, takes it out of geography, and you plot uh, precip against temp, for example, uh, and that has some sort of shape. Again, there's greater densities in some areas, less density in other areas. But for example, there might be areas of low density, but that might be still uh, suitable, these points in between where there's no dots for Johnson grass to survive. And so you, you do some sort of uh, smoothing function on it to try to understand uh, the surface uh, in, in climate space that it survives on. And then you project this into uh, geographic space. So again, our question is about the two different ecotypes, ag and non-ag, do their climate envelopes differ? And so this is a little easier to look at sometimes in geographic space. There's ag and there's non-ag in an early projection of those differences. So we'll cycle again. So you can definitely see some movement. Um, the red, of course, is the uh, most uh, suitable. Uh, and then uh, the deeper the green, the less suitable it is. So this isn't so much describing its range, but the climate envelope of ag and non-ag points, because we do know all of our points, where they were sampled, um, and whether these were agricultural, non-agricultural landscapes. Now, we want to know the same thing about over time, right? The other part of that question. And we can very simply do the same thing. We know which year all of our points come from, and then we just plot them by decade. Um, so then we start to get a, a result of some movement over time. So 1900, 1940. 1980, and now. So again, these are early um, projections of these changes, but there's clearly some difference, so it hasn't, hasn't been sitting still, even for the last um, century, let alone the last two centuries. So here we are. Um, and there's ongoing improvements to, these, uh, to this project. So uh, one of the big issues is I'm, I'm currently working on refining correction for sampling bias. Uh, there's a few, few ways to do that. Uh, to make sure that what we're actually getting is plant occurrence density, not just where people sample it more. And then um, modeling the envelopes using composite variables before they were simple variables for, for a reason uh, related to the empirical thing. So on to the third question, um, do climatic limitations of rhizome and seed survival differ based on ecotype and origin? Um, so again, we remember that it reproduces through seed, reproduces through these rhizomes. And this map right here is very different uh, than the ones I uh, was showing you earlier. So this one is not about the climate envelope so much as what is projected to be limiting in a specific point in geographic space. Um, so the blues are basically where, according to, according to occurrence data, presence only data, which is, I'm gonna get to, to that, um, where uh, the amount of moisture is limiting and where the amount, of, where the temperature is limiting to, and of course this is not um, 
directional. Um, so there's, you know, moisture can be too dry or too wet, and temperature can be too hot or too cold. Um, doing this as simply a modeling approach based on presence only data is really not effective because you, to have these strict thresholds, you need to have um, presence absence would be best, but that doesn't exist. And so what we're doing here is an empirical approach that's going to that's going to find those thresholds of survival um, through different extremes. So first we do it with seed. We do um, find the temperature at which it can be frost killed. Uh, then find uh, when it can be drought killed, uh, basically drought preventing its, its germination. Again, we saw the um, population selecting procedure earlier. So this would not be just across a pop, uh, Precip gradient, also a temperature gradient, and then of course ag and not ag. And then just repeat the same thing for rhizome. And then eventually we would get these limitation maps um, for both seed and rhizome. And of course, where Johnson grass cannot um, uh, reproduce with rhizome, that means it acts as an annual. Uh, so it would no longer be a perennial. We would start to see differences between ag and non ag. And this, this has not been done yet, so that's the uh, uh, experiment I'm, I'm working on currently uh, in finding those empirical limitations to freeze tolerance and drought tolerance on those uh, different reproductive structures. So now we get uh, all that information. We get a differentiation of ag and non-ag, or maybe if there isn't, there's at least differences between populations uh, within those. Uh, we start to understand something about over the last 200 years what Johnson grass, uh, you know, how it's been moving, um, uh, both as a, it, as a whole species as well as the ecotype separately. And we start to understand uh, perenniality geographically. Where can it occur? Where can it not occur? And why do we, you know, what, what do we gain here? And what we gain is a more sensitive understanding of what happens along this curve. And uh, basically using, by answering some of those basic questions, we start to understand that, uh, you know, this is sort of a, a model where the recipient landscape is in a passive role. But beginning here, it's more in an active role. And especially when you look at ag and non-ag, um, ag is something that we do as humans. And so this is, becomes a narrative about how we shape the landscape that becomes invaded and then how that landscape shapes the invader in return. With that, I'd like to thank my advisor, committee, uh, lab mates, and uh, multiple people who helped a lot with helping shape these uh, ideas. Thank you. So do you see differences in the non and ag and the ag ecotypes as far as the way they germinate then? As far uh, as how they're reproducing? Uh, could you clarify what you mean by the way they germinate? Like how they're reproducing. Is, is one reproductive oh. method favored for non ag over ag? Like is it more in the rhizosome versus the seed? Sure, sure. Oh yeah, so we haven't looked at that yet. I mean speaking generally there's no clear uh, difference yet. I mean it's, uh, they, they all vigorously produce rhizome and see, uh, but that would be a really interesting question because if there is a significant difference. Um, one thing about its invasion early early on, uh, back in the uh, 19th century, is uh, before the availability of synthetic herbicide, uh, people will try to till it under, and all they would do is keep cloning it and cloning it, and farmland would get abandoned because of that. But yeah, that's an interesting thing to look at. Yeah. Why do you think that the abundance have, have moved from, from being a problem in agricultural parts to the non agricultural now? <coughs> when or what? Why do you think that the populations have oh. shifted from agricultural mm -hmm. uh, lands mm -hmm. uh, into non agricultural lands? I thought you yeah, showed yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. So there's definitely uh, different selection pressures, um, and we, we expect to be able to at least see that a little bit. So one of them, again, uh, irrigation fertilization would be one cutoff, and we'll see if we see differences there. The other thing is obviously the advent uh, of, of certain herbicide classes just uh, makes it less of an issue there, um, whereas it's it goes largely unmanaged in disturbed areas. Um, the other uh, difference could possibly be, uh, and this would be the sampling bias uh, removal, which which I would I would, I would see there if it makes a difference. Um, a lot of sampling, especially now, happens along roadsides for this type of uh, invasive species. So that could actually dampen that effect um, 
as well. So whereas back in the you know, 1850s, uh, there might have been less of that. Uh, some of our earliest points we have there are from like, uh, the 1890s too, so it's, it would have been a different thing. So it might not just be the occurrence, it might also be sampling. All right, any more questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker.